All right, let's begin. Today we're going to go over fuzzing and dynamic testing and many of the topics in this field. Um, this is a good quote for this lecture that any sufficiently advanced bug is indistinguishable from a feature. And that's from James Whitaker's exploratory software testing book, which is pretty useful. And for the outline of this lecture, we're going to go over bugs, we're going to go over testing, we're going to go over fuzzing and what it is, and some theory behind it, and then the basics of dynamic testing, more fuzzing topics, and taint analysis, and recent publications in the field. So there are two types of testing in general. General testing, which is regression testing, testing of features based in the spec, and tests written by developers, and then there's random testing, and sub fuzzing is a subset of random testing. Although fuzzing should not be called just throwing random stuff at something, it's just throwing specific things at an application to test it, and we'll get into that. So, once you've developed a piece of software, how do you verify that the software performs its features correctly? Uh, and no unintended side effects are there. Well, that takes testing. And one of the challenges of testing is verifying that the software performed correctly for all the given tests, that there are all the right outputs, and that there are all the right or none of the side effects that you don't want. Um, and in order to determine this, it relies on having good specifications beforehand And there's other t challenges, like if you can't distinguish between bugs and features, is testing impossible? And also, if a bug's symptoms are so subtle that they evade automated testing or in manual testing, is testing also useless then too? Well, hopefully prior to testing, you have well-documented source code, you have good specs, good documentation, good readmes, um, you have some test cases written by the developers, you have developers that are aware of security problems, and you have some expectations stated for your testing. Um, in reality, all companies ship software that contains bugs, that's just a fact. For all sufficiently large software, it does contain bugs because it's written by humans. Um, most testing is not concerned with security in general. It's mostly performance-based and feature-based. Um, and there's not a consensus on whether it's better to go after a quantity of bugs in testing or finding more quality bugs. And in general, uh, testing and quality assurance suffers the same fate as security in that it isn't appreciated until there's a major failure and then it, it's still bad news. And also you'll always have bugs you just can't reproduce. That's just a fact. This is a good quote that I want to put in the lecture. This is a an honest job advertisement uh, for a a software development tester and it reads software tester wanted position requires comparing an insanely complicated poorly documented product to a non-existent or woefully incomplete specification help from original developers will be given grudgingly product will be used in environments that vary wildly with multiple users multiple platforms multiple languages and other requirements yet unknown but just as important we're not quite sure how to define them but security and performance are paramount, and post-release failures are unacceptable and could cause us to go out of business. Unfortunately, I'll never see an ad that honest. So, we've covered two ways to discover vulnerabilities in this class so far, and we're going to dive right into fuzzing. There are lots of tools to do it, lots of frameworks that you can spin to write your own tools. It's really easy to make custom ones, and whether or not you have source code is unimportant. Um, but you do have to have uh, access to the binary. Uh, so that last point, I guess, is incorrect. It is also a bit easier than source code auditing and reverse engineering. Um, 
There are other methods to keep in mind, uh, such as dynamic taint analysis and for symbolic execution. Though we won't really cover these in depth and we won't test on these in this class. They are dynamic uh, methods for finding variabilities as opposed to static analysis for source code auditing and reverse engineering. So fuzzing primarily finds bugs and not all bugs are vulnerabilities. And that's important to remember. And it's important that in all the bugs that it finds, you focus on finding the exploitable bugs to prioritize fixing them. So fuzzing is the repeated process of sending specific data to an application in hopes to elicit a certain response. And certain responses are usually some form of crash, some form of error, some form of abnormal behavior, some form of weird application state, something that's not intended, in other words. Specific may be mutated data, generate, generated data, data that's focusing on edge cases of arrays, string lengths, integer, min, max boundaries, or perhaps unanticipated data types. And this will be on the exam, um, so pay attention to this definition. Fuzzing is used very effectively for bug hunting and also software testing. It's used for the software development life cycle in, in uh, Google, Mozilla, Microsoft, Apple, etc. As for bug hunting, it's used for finding vulnerabilities to fix them and exploit them by both good guys and bad guys. It's an effective tool. Um, and bug hunting can be done for also fame and profit in competitions where Vendors put together bounties to find bugs, and I think Pwn to Own this year has a $150,000 prize for uh, the first exploit with full EMET bypass. I forget the details though. So there are there are some fu basic phases to fuzzing and going about it. The first one is you identify the inputs of the application. You basically identify the the attack surface of an application. Then you generate the fuzz data, and there are three different methods that we'll cover for this. Then you execute the fuzz data, and you monitor for exceptions, and you determine if, when the bugs have happened, if they're exploitable. So mutational fuzzing, this is how you generate fuzz data, one of the ways, starts with a known good template. It's basically a seed template that's modified by the fuzzing algorithm, and the output is limited by the starting template. If you have a template that only covers feature, features X and Y, and the application has features X, Y, and Z, you may never, no matter how much you fuzz that template, cover any of the code that tests or handles features Z, because your template only handled X and Y. So that's why I say output is limited by the template in the seed. So this is basically what it does. It takes a known good thing and it mutates it. Um, so generational fuzzing is the next way we're going to cover. It's capable of building the data sent to it based on the model that the developers constructed. So this relies on the developers understanding of that format or of that protocol, uh, of that input, basically. So it is important to note that for each input, there are infinite unaccepted inputs to that. And for each program, there are infinite unaccepted inputs to it. So it's important to get it precisely right when you're doing generational fuzzing. Understand the spec. Perhaps you have to dig up the RFC and go straight from that. And so when I say the limit is really your understanding of the input constraints, it really becomes much more difficult when you try to go from, for instance, growing cats in a test tube to growing homo sapiens in a test tube because they're obviously much more complex. So the more complex an input is to a program, the much harder time you're going to have building a generational fuzzer. So, the next uh, 
method we're going to cover, which also is very relevant to much of next time's lecture, is differential fuzzing. Differential fuzzing is the term for any algorithm that actively reduces the testing state space, as opposed to just plain exhausting it. So you could have a mutational fuzzer that takes x and just increments it by 1 over and over and over and over and over until it's the max or wraps around it and exhausts the state space. Right? That does nothing to actively reduce the number of test cases that you have to run. It just exhausts all of them. Differential fuzzing, on the other hand, actively identifies through heuristics or an algorithm what it doesn't need to test. It's like, okay, I've tested this. These other cases are irrelevant. So I'm just going to trim those out of my plan and just focus on what I really need to do. And so that's what differential fuzzing is all about. It's focused on automating test cases, automating test case reduction, and also focused on covering code paths. So it can do this by recognizing constraints and other heuristics, and we'll cover those in a little bit. But before we go any further, when talking about testing, especially in a scientific sense, it's very, very important to talk about the Eddington number, especially to establish a frame of reference from which we can deem things as possible versus in infeasible. 10 to the 80 is approximately the number of known protons in the known universe. Uh, and this was calculated back in 1920s, and I don't know how, don't ask me how, um, but it hasn't been changed, so it must be good. Effectively, if you were to try to generate all the test cases up front and store them in a computer, say the computer is infinitely powerful, well, no, Say it's finitely powerful and it has all the power of the known universe. That's more correct. It would not be able to carry out any fuzzing test cases if they are greater than 10 to the 80 because you can't store 10 to the 81 test cases in 10 to the 80 because say we only have uh, RAM units for each proton then there's not enough protons to store everything. So. If you try to iterate through 10 to the 80, however, it will be possible as long as you're discarding the test cases as you no longer, if you've tested them. Um, it's just going to be slow. Uh, it may be paralyzable, uh, which is good. Um, and you're going to have to have an algorithm to determine success. Otherwise, if you wait to go back and check the results all afterwards, it's going to be a problem because you've discarded everything. So you have to test and check in place. So you'll probably be going to be looking for crashes and doing some taint analysis, and we'll cover that later. Let's cover an example. Say you have an, just an HD pi picture. Um, and say each pixel is represented by the HTML-friendly hex triplet. So first byte is red, second byte is green, third byte is blue. So each pixel represents 256 to the third colors, to the three colors, not third. Um, so that's roughly 16 million. And so fuzzing the whole space would be the number of possible pixel, colors per pixel raised to the combination of the dimensions. And so this number is going to be very, very large, much larger than this astronomical limit. Um, so this is one example of things that is just not feasible to exhaustively test or fuzz. And so it's really important to target your efforts and reduce test case space when possible. Um, and it also is one of those things that shows that there will always be bugs for sufficiently large programs because for certain things you're not going to be able to exhaustively test them. And so it is important to also target your efforts in minimizing the amount of time these things take. So fuzzing is often parallelizable, and this is a huge help in cutting down the amount of time it takes. If you are just running sequential fuzzing, just one test is going to take forever. 
It makes no sense to do it that way. And so in fuzzing design, if your fuzzer takes significantly larger than big O of just N of your, your input space, um, you're probably doing it wrong. Uh, this is a fast file fuzzer tool that our guest lecturer, Mitch, has put together. Um, it's a Python-based tool. It uses mutational-based fuzzing and uses PyDebug to monitor for signals of interest in the target application. It has a client-server architecture that allows any number of clients to connect to the server and start doing fuzzing in a parallel fashion. And each client handles some portion of the fuzzing job in order to do that. So it can distribute fuzzing in a cloud-like fashion and split up a set of all the things to fuzz over among each client and then, as I said, run them in parallel. So to recap, the three ways that we've covered to generate fuzz data are mutational-based fuzzing, generational, and differential-based fuzzing. So it is pointless to fuzz something without paying attention to it, and this, this is Dynamic Analysis 101 um, you have to have some sort of test harness for what you're testing. So there are two types of testing, white box and black box testing in general. There's also kind of a gray box testing where you try and learn as little information as you can in order to do what you need to do so you don't waste more time than you need learning the application just to find vulnerabilities. Um, but we'll cover just white box and black box. And Gray box is pretty self-explanatory. So for white box testing, you would have the source code, and you'd be able to build it, you have the build tools, you have access to architecture, you can run it. And so in this sense, crashes, when you're looking for them, they're very easy to detect. You basically fuzz something, you detect exceptional behavior, then you determine if it's a bug, you determine its vulnerability, and we'll get into this. Um, however, still, Things like logic flaws are very, very hard to detect. They're actually generally feasible to detect. Um, because it requires a very deep understanding of what the developers were trying to do, what they interpreted the spec to mean, and what the spec developers intend to do and finding discrepancies there. So basically, when you're fuzzing something, your test harness is going to be check if the process has died, check if it's been zombified, check if the process ID is, is just gone, in other words, it's died. Um, you're going to want to check any of the logs for crash warnings or uh, error messages, and preferably you're going to want to, if possible, attach a debugger and check the process state. That's the best you can do. Um, however, some things have anti-reverse engineering, anti-fuzzing, and anti-debugging things mechanisms, I'd rather say, in them. Many uh, video games prevent the attaching of debuggers and just quit right away because that's how most hacks are engineered. This is the most basic way to do it. So instead, the, the hacks have to hook into the graphics card level stuff and the operating system level stuff sometimes. So, <clears throat> what if you can't get any introspection of any form. This word introspection is the ability to inspect the target state to see whether or not it's crashed or is engaging in exceptional behavior that we're trying to cause through fuzzing. What if you can't get any introspection? Uh, what if you can't view the process state? How are you going to be able to detect crashes? Um, perhaps in practice you're going to have to solder on wires to some sort of set up and determine what the hell is going on. Um, perhaps that's also not possible. So, um, in our homework for homework five, you're going to actually have to build your own fuzzer and find bugs and vulnerabilities in a popular application, and we're going to ethically disclose them. And you'll have to the end of the semester to do this. So, on that note, let me provide some guidance on fuzzing. Fuzzing in general 
the 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 outputs from your fuzzer should be common enough to pass the most elementary checks that the program makes on its inputs. And at the same time, that data must be uncommon enough in order to trigger exceptional behavior. So this leads us to a discussion of constraints. Something that would cause exceptional behavior in this case would be when x is greater than 10. Otherwise, it executes some safe code. But determining whether or not something is dangerous or safe obviously takes testing or analysis beforehand because it's not likely the developer, although I have seen them do this, be like, don't run this, this is dangerous, or likely buffer overflow here. I have found bugs that way. <laughs> so, this is a more interesting discussion. Um, there are two ways to get to this path. And there are infinite ways to get this path because there are infinite things that Y could be, and infinite things that X could be, other than these. And it's pretty self explanatory. So it means that when we're fuzzing things, we are essentially limited by these constraints and these programs. And that even if we can, exhaust an infinite space, 99.99999% of our time might be occupied by path two, regardless of how powerful we are. So this is one of the fundamentally limiting things in fuzzing, are these constraints and recognizing them in programs. And these things, these, these constraints cause branches, and when we get into code paths, you're going to be exposed to a topic called uh, branch explosion or code path explosion. We're going to have to discuss how to avoid it when uh, tracking uh, code path space. So here's a very, very basic constraint. This, this program exits right away unless it has the proper number of inputs. So like I said, fuzzing in general must be common enough that it passes the basic constraints, but it must also be uncommon enough that it tests the uncommon cases. So, for instance, if X is a complex type, it does very complex operation. Otherwise, it does a very simple operation. So it's very important to test both cases and to perhaps focus more on complex stuff as well. So keep this in mind as we get the code pass. So another thing to be aware of is Remember in the heap unlinking algorithm, there's this, there's this bit, the least significant bit is not used because the size of the chunks are always even. So they decided to pack that value and use the bit for something else. Well, bit packing is very, very frequently done at very low level code. And so this kind of constraint often is used for very low level stuff, for stuff that's important, for stuff that if it were to go wrong, a lot of bad stuff would happen. So bitwise precision is something to be very aware of. Um, and so let's talk about the different types of targets and goals in just a broad manner. Um, environment variables in Linux and Windows are things that are to be aware of. Uh, they control where your home directory is when you try to go there. They control where your current directory is. They control what your process name is. They control what your uh, your user shell is. They control all sorts of different things that coordinate launching other processes. Other things to, on the flip side, in network land, um, there are flags and protocols, positional arguments, things that you want to flip, the IP addresses, the protocol flags themselves, the length of the packet specifier, the CRC, you know, the checksum, and then there's file formats that you want to fuzz, web applications basically are fuzzable, and so on and so on. All sorts of things are fuzzable. And so an attacker's goals are really to corrupt the code logic, to achieve arbitrary code execution, 
or perhaps to escalate their privileges, perhaps to spawn a shell, um, and we could talk about that all day long, but we'll get that, that stuff later, in exploitation later, and it best behooves us to focus our, our efforts on five general properties that are useful to test. And these five are going to be on the exam. And uh, first one is the, the application inputs, the states of the application, the code passed in the application, the user data that the application might handle, and the environment that the application runs in. So it is usually insufficient to just test one at a time. Usually bugs manifest when a number of these are tested together. For instance, a web page. Say the add and delete users page is only available to the admin. Well, testing this and seeing the other ways that this might be available would be um, fuzzing code pass for the add delete users while also testing the state. Uh, so it might be useful to fuzz the flags and values in the cookie to manipulate the state while accessing this web page, which is the code path. So just-in-time compilation and execution heavily depends on the global, global search engine state. I mean, global engine state, I'm sorry. And so that's a combination of state and code paths as well. And protocols, um, usually stateful protocols have some sort of state machine. And so it is useful to test them by getting it to a specific state and then sending it unusual state change packets uh, to perhaps trigger an uh, anomalous state change and then seeing what you're able to do from there. So we've covered integer min max and boundaries and unsigned ones. Um, and other atomic values are practically infinite. Um, and it's obviously very useful to test the min max values in their edge cases. And yeah, for integer values, we've covered this. Um, especially useful to test anything going into malloc and testing the edge cases because there may be a plus one to account for a, a null terminator so if you manage to get to the signed integer max you may be able to do weird things <coughs> <coughs> so these are this slide is stolen from some of Mitch's lectures but uh basically explains ranges that you want to test to plus or minus perhaps up to 16 for 32-bit and so on um, and then obvious string repetitions to cause perhaps buffer overflows you know throwing A's at is a typical hacker approach but uh, sometimes in CTFs they're going to prevent you from having capital A's in, or lowercase A's in your input and uh, we'll just quit right away, which is pretty funny. <coughs> <coughs> then uh, more useful is fuzzing delimiters. So in like spreadsheets, CSVs, uh, maybe the delimiter is a comma. And uh, so you may be able to fuzz whatever's parsing it by throwing an abnormal amount of commas at it and triggering exceptional behavior and then perhaps varying the length of the strings that are separated by the limiters or increasing the frequency of the limiter um, may cause exceptional behavior um, and may cause the application to parse the data in a different manner uh, which leads to discussion on SQL injection which we'll get to later and also cross-site scripting and other web style attacks Oh, we've covered format strings, so it's useful sometimes to fuzz them when uh, you're dealing with C and C++ applications. 
and as I said, the percent %s dereferences the stack value, the percent %n writes to a pointer, uh, which is yet another dereference, and uh, when, when fuzzing format strings, the longer is usually better, because eventually enough dereferences, you're going to dereference something that's all zeros on the stack. And that's going to cause a site fault, and that's going to cause a good test case to analyze for later to determine whether or not there's a vulnerability. We sort of likely it is. Um, fuzzing character translations uh, UTF 16, UTF 8 are very different, but uh, they are often treated the same, and sometimes there can be vulnerabilities when they're done that way, especially with, you know, as we've discussed, wide character formats and how those affect strings and how they're used. Um, so, for instance, there are some also special modifiers in UTF-16. Oh, I freaking hate that. And so all these special symbols you see above and below are actually caused only by these extra characters. And so there's only two characters here, U and S. So U is here and S is there. And everything after this is enabled by these special character modifiers. So I believe CD, the byte CD, denotes that whatever follows this goes below. And CC denotes that whatever follows this goes above. And in alternating patterns, it can be done almost ad nauseum. And so that might be an interesting way to pack shellcode into a string, um, if possible. However, CC is the trap instruction. Uh, well, not trap, but yeah, interrupt. So other things that are useful to fuzz, directory traversal, uh, which is useful for targeting web applications, network daemons, etc. And it's also useful to try these things in different character encodings. For instance, uh, the byte 5c is, is this slash in Unicode. Um, and then meta character and command injection, very similar to delimiter injection, delimiter fuzzing, is very useful when fuzzing uh, web applications, CGI scripts, network games, and etc. Um, so this leads us to file types. Um, I believe we talked about in Unix and Linux how files don't get can, don't get inspected by the type of file is not determined by the suffix, the, the dot ending. It's determined by two byte identifier at the beginning of the file, which is called the magic number. So GIFs have magic numbers of GIF 87A or GIF 89A. And it might be useful when trying to get weird types of file past maybe a firewall or a file filter or something to spoof file extensions for old file types. Maybe, for instance, PHP used to also accept PHP 3. Um, before PHP 4 and 5 became more common, I suppose. And then also useful for, uh, un unrelated to that, you can fuzz the content metadata in web traffic, say you're uploading a .exe and you tell it this, it's uh, type JPEG, it might uh, accept it and then allow you to run it on the web server by accessing it. Um, and then also uh, in Windows, I think in Windows, past Windows, you can fuzz special folders, and this allows you to do weird forms of privilege escalation, which I don't know much more about. There are also poly file types. Um, this this website, um, on Google Code, has a proof of concept that generates a file that is valid portable executable, valid PDF, valid HTML web page plus JavaScript, and also uh, Java resource file, and also Python code, all in one, which is very interesting if you're looking for something to start fuzzing something with. Um, 
Now also for fuzzing, fuzzing network data, um, it's useful to model the network protocol that you're fuzzing. Um, usually you'll be able to find some sort of state machine model that you can do generational fuzzing with. Um, but maybe you're looking at an unknown protocol and you have to model it first. Um, so in doing so, you're going to have to start identifying what the protocol headers are, what the flags are, and you're going to try bit flipping those. And some, some uh, protocols allow you to influence the state of an entire machine. For instance, the network time syncing service uh, has been in use since 1985, and it is something that you can actually uh, attack and change the time of a machine on a network with. Perhaps that might influence how cookies are handled. Perhaps that might influence how crypto is done. Perhaps that might influence um, uh, some sort of antivirus scan or something or delay it. Um, there's all sorts of things that could influence and it's an interesting target. It can also be used to um, to weaken crypto because a lot of random number generation has one of its seeds based on the system time. If you can trigger a crypto algorithm or operation at a known time, you have a lot of useful information. You probably know what algorithm it's using and also the seed that it was given. You could probably very easily figure out exactly what keys were generated at that time. Um, let's not get more into cryptography because that's covered very well in other classes. So back to discussion on modeling arbitrary network protocols. Um, it turns out that uh, pattern mapping techniques used in biomathematics and in uh, uh, gene analysis works actually very well for detecting structures and protocols. And it's very helpful for modeling them and building a state machine and then using that to generate tra sample traffic for that protocol. Uh, however, that is largely one of the advanced topics of the offensive network security class um, that my buddy Joshua is teaching. And I'm excited to see that stuff in later in the semester. And that is going to be it for this lecture. We're going to pick up with crash analysis and taint analysis next time. Also, um, the first midterm is next Monday, and next time we will have a midterm review. The midterm, I already told you, stop. The midterm will uh, be largely uh, stuff similar to the homeworks, and it will be relatively simple. And that's it.